Yep. That's a good one because that leads right into the gun, the firearm stuff that, you know, Paolo, I was talking to you about before and the research that we did. The lesson I learned through the research and I, and I applied it after the research was done was I started off um, and we'll get into the re- what the research was in a second. I started off training with the freshly fired firearm and then would work my way down to shell casings and different types of weapons and so forth. The next round of dogs I did after that research I actually started off with lower amounts of the GSR, starting with get sent tubes that were had GSR on them, um, the uh, shell casings, but only a couple versus like a handful. Um, and I saw performance shoot way up operationally with a lot of dogs uh, compared to the ones where I started with a heavier amount of the GSR aspect. So in the gunshot or in the firearm research, tell people... I'll give the layman version I tell people is we're focusing on gunshot residue, not the powder by itself, the oil by, you know, we've kind of learned through that research that the GSR was our, our best component to work with. Um, and I know you break it down into the actual chemicals of those things and what stands off, but for the person who may not understand that, um, GSR aspect. So go ahead and share that research a little bit and what we discovered when we did that. Well, that research was, um, interesting that I kind of was, um, a little bit scandalous in the way that, you know, we know that gunshot residue equates to DPA or diphenylamine. But when we did it, we we tested um, the full weapon, we tested empty magazines, we tested the fully loaded magazines, and then the fully loaded in the weapon and unloaded in the weapon. Um, and what we found was that actually diphenylamine wasn't a main compound in in the systems, no matter the combinations, um, which was um, surprising in the sense that, like you said, sometimes people were like, oh, just train on the DPA. But that wasn't a main signature. It was, but it was, you know, trace levels in some cases, and it wasn't the main one. Mm-hmm. Some of the compounds that we did find were some of the additives in the smokeless powders, like nonanol. Um, we also found tetradecane, which are some of those overlapping with human scent and that's when we were chatting you and i cameron they were like well you're handling the magazine you're loading it um there's a time prepping the weapon before you even shoot it um and how much um or how little actually um it was basically named that people even uh, you know attribute human scent or these other contaminants as also part of that signature um and so the main thing was that th- that some of the odor profiles were different based on like the fully loaded versus like, you know, just the magazine and the importance of training to the different parts of the weapon and not just, you know, doing just magazine or just doing the full weapon mm-hmm. because there were differences that we found when we actually did the odor profiling of each part. Um, what we didn't do in that initial research was the actual casings or the ammunition, which is what I've been doing for the past few months, um, where we took kind of the firearm to the side and we actually focused on uh, nine millimeter, 40 and 45 calibers and actually doing the odor profiling of just those, just as ammunition itself. Mm -hmm. And then sampling that pre-fire and then post-fire. And it was actually also done not only for the canine application, but also for these type of ballistic examinations to see if you find it. I mean, obviously you do have the information in some sometimes, but sometimes you may not given how damaged it is or the length of time. Um, so you were trying to see if we could have like a barcode. <coughs> well, we found <coughs> that the different um, calibers were starting to be categorized post-fire a little bit more than pre-fire. Okay. So, <laughs> What is, because this comes up frequently now, because now the question, and we can come at it from the OSAC ASB standards, as well as what certification authorities are starting to struggle with now, is what should we be testing the dog on? And is the gunpowder relevant enough of a signature? Because now, as we've talked about before between us, was there's that fine line of becoming a bomb dog and or a gun dog, right? What do we say for those that are concerned about if they don't train the powders, will the dogs not find ammunition? Um, I think that the answer is a little bit, it's kind of a, a layered. Um, obviously training on powder, you're giving a representative of what some of the ammunition and the actual weapon has. 
I just think that is a disservice if you don't train on the actual weapon and lending yourself into actually saying, no, I didn't find anything just because like, I guess what we were saying here, the variations, it's a variation. Um, providing that weapon gives other compounds so that the canine is exposed to that actually identifies the full system versus just a smokeless where <clears throat> some of the firearms had a lot of it, but some of the others didn't have much of it. So again, we're quick to judge that the dog is making a miss, you know, a lack of identification, a lack of response, where it's just that it wasn't exposed to the variation. Um, <clears throat> so what I've always said is like, from that firearm research was to give the whole picture into just not focusing on the smoke list as has been in the past and actually providing the, the scenarios of the barrel, the magazine, because that's all sources of contamination of routine handling that can expose the canine to another variation that the smoke list powder alone doesn't give you. Yep. So, okay, so now this brings us to a testing procedure. What do we want to focus on when it comes to testing and certification of a firearms detection dog? What would be the recommendation? Um, and I, I know it's some of this still being worked out, but based on the research that you're seeing so far, what would be the most critical aspect to make sure that the dog understands if we're looking at a firearms detection dog? Definitely like a, in a pre-firing scenario, because sometimes Again, we're focusing on the on the post event, the post firing event, but I would say focusing on the pre fire, like brand new ammunition, just the you know empty firearm, and then the post fire to give the casing, to give a fully loaded magazine, to give that whole scenario of the pre and post, because okay. like you were saying before, Cameron, the post is going to have that's my highest concentrations. So you're biasing your your training into starting with a high odor concentration amounts versus never giving something that has never been fired. Maybe you have a concealed weapon scenario where somebody is, you know, um, transporting it or, you know, like depending on the scenario we're talking about the firearm detection of a weapon that hasn't been fired in a couple of months, years. I don't know. Someone just found it in the closet in their house and now they're going to plan a, a um, some some action. So that's that's where it needs to be both the pre and the post because I'm finding that the, the, the order profiling is different in both scenarios. So I can give you an example operationally. We had a dog in Southern California mm -hmm. that found a firearm that was 100 years old, hadn't been fired in 66 years. And the GSR levels were pretty, obviously the dog was still detecting it. Um, how do we... I guess what I'm getting at is that we've, if we've got a – how do we throttle that, basically? How do we say, okay – because every – technically, every firearm that's sold has been fired. It's got a, a test fire into it. So let me ask you this. How, how contaminated is that gun with GSR or you know, the main things that we're looking for odor-wise for a dog? I actually I know it's going to be low a, level, but – It's low level um, because actually even when you buy a brand-new firearm, it's been fired, test fired – before it's in the package. Yep. So I actually got um, a set of police officers got brand new firearms and I basically ripped the package, never been handled. And I wanted to see how, what it was from like factory firing to odor profile. So the gunshot residue is gonna be there. Um, but I also like in the original research we did, Cameron, <laughs> we tested or we I took the variables of like, when was the last time you cleaned it? When was the last time you fired it? You know, all these other things that I could start doing correlations as to the amount of concentration that I was getting and the variables. Um, and obviously the people that had clean or routinely clean it right after the range had a little bit less of concentration than people that left it there mm -hmm. and maybe cleaned it. <clears throat> Days later, weeks. weeks later, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> the, so if I'm, again, because the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I, I get in these conversations with these cert authorities a lot of times saying that we need to reevaluate the current standards as they're written because most standards, as you guys know too, it is looked at as they mm -hmm. need to find the solvent, they need to find the oil, they need to find oil. the shell mm -hmm. casing, they need to find the powder, like I said, I was saying, the powder the, then the gun, mm -hmm. and then different forms. And I'm saying, let's drop the solvents, let's drop the oils, let's 
do the GSR, the gun, the gun parts, the the ammunition. Then as soon as I say ammunition, then it turns into, well, this is why I need to train on the powder. So the at where you're at right now with the research on the ammunition, how much of the unburned powder is really there as opposed to somebody who's training on a bag or a small bag of smokeless powder? How would we compare the, what, do you, what do you see under the under the GSMR? So it's funny because I tested a series of smokeless powders uh, samples themselves, <clears throat> and then the actual ammunition. <clears throat> With the ammunition, however, I was starting to get a little bit more. Um, overlap with some of the human scent compounds than I did with the smokeless powders. <clears throat> Obviously, because the smokeless powders have the additives, have the plasticizers on them, where the ammunition itself has that metal casing over it. So it gives me that protection and also the amount of stuffing or like when they stuff the smokeless powder is going to be different because I tested different brands within the same caliber. So the, the odor picture with that metal introduction is giving me different signal than just the powder because the powder doesn't have that mm -hmm. casing to it. Um, so just from the get go, that that profiling gave me distinctiveness. Yeah. So that tells us right there we can <laughs> train on ammunition. No problem. But focusing on the powder by itself is not matching what we really want the dog to find when it comes to a firearm. Would that so yeah, be correct? the smokeless powder is going to give you. That's the magic DPA. That's <clears throat> yep. where we're going to get it, because obviously the met, the like the metal is not being a barrier when I'm, and also is the limitation of the sampling technique. The fiber is picking up the highest concentration, you know, the most readily available VOC. Mm -hmm. If we have no metal jacket covering that powder, well, you get your DPA. Yeah. If you and have that where... metal on it, then you're going to start hindering, and there's going to be a combination of yeah. It's, it's slowly emitting through that metal, but then you're also going to get the metal components. Um, and that's where the difference lies. Perfect. In the that's, training. That's what people need to hear right there. Okay, so now we're moved into the ghost guns, the 3D printed guns. Tell us what you're learning about polymers and what we're learning about these 3D printed guns. So this is my my baby project. So we're just embarking on it. Um, actually, the hopefully the, the ammunition paper will come out very soon where the three caliber stuff. Um, that's kind of after the original research we did, Cameron. And then the ghost guns, it's because, well, it's an up and coming threat. Um, like I was telling you before, from a ballistic point of view, the, the striation marks that are routinely used for comparisons is non-existent in the ghost gun. Um, and well, canine wise, well, there's, we don't know anything about the polymer. We don't know what's the most common polymers that are being used. So <clears throat> what we're trying to do is A, starting to understand what type of polymers are being the most um, common to fabricate these ghost guns and actually doing some headspace profiling. Because it's polymers, I don't want obviously to, I want to see the concentrations or the ratios um, so that we're, obviously we're not, <laughs> everything that we have polymer base is not going to be um, identified. So we're trying to understand, um, and I'm collaborating <clears throat> with Dr. John Carell, um, who's in the Honors College here at Texas Tech, um, and we're trying to see the different types of polymers that we can sample. And then the goal would be to actually um, 3D print some of the ghost guns ourselves and, and test fire to see what we get in terms of the odor profile before. So when we're actually right off the printer mm -hmm. and then after the firing incident and see how the odor profile changes or the traces that we can find. Because that would be in the case of firearm detection dogs, what they would encounter on scene. Um, and how that changes from like a real ammunition casing to the traces that we get when we when, you, when we fire the ghost gun. And that's going to be, which could be a critical aspect for the evaluation in the future for gun or firearm detection dogs to and now maybe include some ghost gun aspect to test to see to make sure the dogs are detecting it even in this kind of setup or odor profile with polymers and so forth. And sure. it's like I told you off the air, you know, myself and Gamble will be ready to do, to add to the research there. And, and I, me personally, I, I'm just super curious with him, um, knowing what I, he was my first one under a research project. And now it's been what, we're at four years since we did it, I think, right around there. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I am just curious just to see what he would do because I've never ever exposed him to any kind of 3D printed type gun. So I, this he would be your perfect blank slate uh, when we do this, and it, it's I, my curiosity is, is is triggered as well to to learn this. So. This will be a good update, and those that are listening and related to firearm dogs, this is going to be a, a, a great piece of information once the research is done. What would you say, I'm sure we're probably within like a year or so, maybe give or take more for our next level of probably results to come by out? by the end of the year, we'll have finished some of the first prototypes okay. um, <clears> of <throat> the different polymers. It's going kind of quickly, so to say, yeah. now that we are kind of on, in firearm mode. Um, okay. So, and the goal is that this actually this summer... We're going to start testing some of the 3D printing Perfect. Um, of the actual gun devices. So by, I would say, early next year, we should have some of the first batch of results in. Fantastic. That'll be great.